for those of you who don't know what Club Divin is and are joining and are curious, um, Club Divin is, I think the most important thing to start with is just by saying that Club Divin is first and foremost a wine club. It's about experiences and community. Um, so basically, of course, we are an NFT wine club. And I'm sure for those of you thinking, how do NFTs and wine pair? Because an NFT is something, and we'll get into the details of that shortly, but an NFT is something that is often attached to something that is either a digital or a physical asset. Uh, and what we're doing is we're attaching it to a consumable product, which is wine. So a lot of people kind of, that's kind of where, where people stop and say, okay, I don't understand this from that point. So um, Club Divin, based on experience, is a wine club, right? So we've got three NFTs within the club. The first one is your membership NFT. The membership NFT is just like joining a, a golf club, right? You have access to things. So some of the things you have access to are incredible, specially curated events all over the world. Um, of course, wine focused, gastronomy focused. Uh, we've got a number of very, very exciting um, and, and quite prominent people in the wine world um, who make up our group of founding members, David Four being one of them, uh, a master of wine. Hello. Um, and I'll let you introduce yourself shortly. I just want to get the little the spiel out of the way here. Um, and then, yeah, so, so basically you've got your membership NFT gives you access to these great experiences. It gives you access to fantastic offers on investment grade wine. So rare collectible bottles, um, at about a, a targeted 10%, uh, discount source directly from the, the producer or from pristine sellers, for example, like Robert Parker's personal collection. Um, so yeah. And then basically the second NFT is a digital cork. So this is an NFT that is, that is actually the digital twin to the physical asset. So, and we're talking about investment grade wines. It's basically the digital deed of ownership that you, or we attach to a bottle of wine through NFC communication. There's going to be more information on that coming soon. Um, and then basically what that does is it proves provenance. So if a wine is sourced directly from the seller, uh, of a fantastic producer, um, then you know it's authentic, comes directly from the source. Um, and then that NFT is a smart contract that actually lives on a blockchain. Um, and what that creates is it creates transparency because it's a public ledger. Um, so anytime that that wine then trades hands on the secondary market, um, every single owner is, is public, right? So you can, you can see the entire uh, trading process, how many times it's switched ownership, um, if it has it all, if it's moved, where it's gone. Um, ideally, investment grade wines don't move a lot, um, just like fine art. A lot of the time it will stay in a bonded warehouse somewhere and trade hands. It could trade hands five, six times um, and it may never hang on a wall. So, um, so this is the digital cork technology that we're attaching to investment grade wines. And then what happens is when you actually want to consume the product, you digitally uncork the bottle, that NFT is burned, which means it's destroyed um, because the wine is no longer saleable. What then happens to your digital cork is it becomes a soldier. If anyone doesn't know what a soldier is, because I have to admit that I didn't, um, a soldier is basically an epic bottle of wine that you drank and you probably wanna keep the bottle. So a lot of people have like an epic shelf uh, in their wine cellar um, and that'll be those, those dusty old bottles that you have great memories connected to. Um, and, and yeah, so basically that NFT is now a memory. It's stored through the Divin app. You've got your tasting journey and your digital seller. Uh, these are things that we'll get into in much more detail in other webinars. Um, you, can, you can check it out online. There's a lot more information there. Um, but yeah, it basically helps you track your tasting journey. And then what happens that's really interesting is... Uh, a QR code pops up when you scan your digital, your when you scan the bottle of wine that's connected to a digital cork through the Divin app, basically what happens is this little screen pops up and it says digitally uncork the bottle. So you've opened it now. The app knows that you've opened it. The NFT is destroyed. You've got your soldier. Um, and then a QR code pops up and it and it is a QR code that represents the third NFT in the Club Divin technology scheme. And that is your tasting token NFT. So what that is, is it's actually a way for you to share your tasting experience 
with anybody you shared that bottle with. So they don't have to be a member of Club Divin. They don't have to be tech savvy. Nobody has to be tech savvy uh, to be a member of Club Divin or enjoy the benefits or the experience. It's very, very simple. Um, everything is, is enabled by blockchain, but you don't have to know about blockchain to enjoy the benefits um, or even use the technology. It's really simple, really slick. Um, so you scan this QR code, you share it with all your friends who you drank the bottle with. And then what happens is it's dropped instantly into your crypto wallet. If you don't already have a crypto wallet, it builds you one in like 10 seconds. Um, so now you've got your crypto wallet, you've got your first NFTs or your NFT. Um, and what that actually is, is it's, it's a video. It's a small, it's a short video. I think they're about 10, 12 seconds long and it's the journey of the wine. So what it is, is it's got all kinds of metadata built in about the producer, the vintage, where you were, you can customize it yourself and actually put in data that says where you were when you drank the bottle, who you were with, you can personalize it with tasting notes. It's uh, it's quite cool. Um, but yeah, so basically this, this tasting token then also lives in your virtual cellar in your tasting journey. Um, and there's incentives built into this that are great for the consumer and, and great for the winemaker. Um, so basically the winemaker now knows, this is so interesting. The winemaker now knows the journey of his wine through the digital cork. He now knows when it was opened. This normally a winemaker doesn't know the end consumer of their wine, right? You often have, it could be sold direct to the consumer, but often there's a distributor in the middle. It could trade hands so many times on the aftermarket. So the, so the producer loses complete track of where that bottle is, how long it's been aged, you know, is it, did it end up in San Francisco and, and the winemakers in Bordeaux, who knows? So now he knows, and that is really valuable information for a wine producer. Um, even more interesting is they now know who shared the bottle, who else could be a potential customer. So for the winemaker, there's a lot of incentive. Um, we also go into more detail about all of that uh, in our tasting token talks, but uh, this one is, is focused on royalties. That's a great topic as well. Um, and then for the consumer, to, the, the, yeah. Sorry, just, Dave. sorry, just to jump in on that, Jenna, I think that point of the, the winemaker wanting to know who is consuming their wine it, yes, it can help for sales. It can help them figure out how their future sales could go. But really, when when as a winemaker and talking to other winemakers, I, I want to know who's drinking it just to know who's drinking it. And uh, so I, I think connecting with everybody along the whole chain of of uh, possession, buying, whatever it is, is is immensely powerful. Yeah, and it's this it's a community, right? This whole thing has a huge sense of community um, kind of built in. So that is a major, major, major focus. Um, and then, yeah, and also just the bragging rights, because let's face it, you know, my generation, we're so focused on social media and it's like all the flex. So Instagram actually announced or Meta announced um, not too long ago, hi, Jerusha, um, that they're going to be introducing a way where you can actually like instantly share your NFTs on social media. Um, so we are starting to really see this become a little more mainstream. I think we can all admit that in the wine industry, we are really on the forefront of this. We are probably a little bit early for a general consumer to really adopt it, but I think it's great. The club even is on the forefront of it. Um, and yeah, and I'm really excited about it. So that all aside, we should do some introductions. Jerusha is here. Um, and yeah, the, the three of us are, are Club Divin founding members. So David, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Um, I'm David Four. I'm a master of wine and I'm uh, reaching you from Barcelona right now where I live. Though I am like Jana and uh, unfortunately, Jerusha, you can't be part of the club. We're, I'm a proud Canadian like Jana, but that's okay. But I live for uh, many Canadian years. Friends. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, I lived for a long time in San Francisco before moving here to Spain, and I uh, have a winery. I have a, a 10 hectare vineyard in the Priorat and produce uh, 30,000 bottles of wine here in Spain, including a top uh, cuvee that is what I would like to think is part of this collectibles group of uh, wines. Awesome. All right. Jerusha, you're up. I, I am joining you all from... Chelsea, New York. I my parking garage is full, so you know, I couldn't circle the block enough times to find a spot. So I apologize, and you get me from my car. So happy to have you, New York. <laughs> New York um, I was a, some. I've been a sommelier 
since I was 22. Uh, joined Silicon Valley Bank after a long time here in New York and financed wineries, kind of uh, mostly wineries around your size, uh, David, and did that for a while, worked on a wine startup, and I'm lucky to be a part of Divin now. Awesome. I, th I think for those, uh, I, I think if, for those in Europe who might not have heard of Silicon Valley Bank, and maybe just, I would just like to point out, it's like the number one place for anything finance related for wineries in America. Yeah, you, I mean, it's, think? it's yeah. primarily a, a bank that finances venture funds and venture backed startups. And uh, there is a very small division that's based in Napa, Sonoma, and the central coast of California. Uh, with also a small group that's up in the Pacific Northwest. And they finance, provide debt financing, not equity financing, but debt financing for all of these uh, US-based wineries. It's, there's a really great relationship between the tech community and Napa, Sonoma, Paso, uh, Santa Barbara, just because of the proximity. So a lot of these founders and and venture capitalists that we fund are also great lovers of wine. They like to entertain up in in wine country. It's you know that it's a wonderful relationship between both sides of the bank. And Silicon Valley Bank is very progressive in the way that they look at at providing financing. And you know you need to borrow money to make money in some capacity. That's what I think. <laughs> right on. Cool. Um, so yeah, so my name is Jana Kryline. Um, I am, as David pointed out, Canadian, but I'm based in Düsseldorf, Germany. So where Pro Wine is just coming to an end. It's been a busy few days. Very exciting. Um, and yeah, I started, um, I started out after a, a year of business school, I decided I was going to move away and, and start working in restaurants and traveling the world. And I guess the wine bug bit me along the way. Um, I worked in restaurants in London, Toronto, and New York. Uh, I took a little little detour and studied film in New York City for a year, and I loved that. Um, and then I moved to Toronto and and started working in restaurants again, living the the stereotypical waitress actress, you know, life. Um, and then I started doing my sommelier education. Uh, started with the quartermaster sommeliers in Toronto, um, and just thought, you know, I love reading about wine in the books, but I think the old world is where I need to be right now. So. Also didn't hurt that um, my boyfriend at the time, now husband, was in Europe and is European. So after five years long distance, I said, okay, uh, it's time. So I got rid of my apartment. I think a week later, I, I had emailed a bunch of wineries in Germany um, because I just wanted to get a foot in the door in the wine industry anywhere. So I emailed all the wineries in the city he was studying in. And the, the best one, that the one I was most interested in, emailed me back right away and said, we already started Harvest. Can you be here next week? And I was like, Yep, on it. So I did that. And then I did a, an internship working for the same winery. It's Fein Gut Amstein, fantastic award-winning winery in Germany and Franconia. Um, and then, yeah, I, I did three harvests with them. I worked in the cellar vineyards um, and in the sales team and they made me export manager. I brought the wines into a few new markets, the UK, Canada, Scandinavia. And during that time, I started an Instagram account that picked up without me intending for it too. Um, started out as just a little bit of a, a push for myself to, to get out of the Franconian bubble and keep tasting everything else and, and, you know, pushing myself to do that. So then the Instagram account picked up and it's opened so many doors for me. Uh, it's been really incredible. I filmed a TV show two years ago with Aldo Sam, who's one of the world's top sommeliers um, in New York. Jerusha worked with Aldo. Um, yeah. And, and now I'm with Devin and I'm loving it. So I've gone down the NFT and, and blockchain rabbit hole now. So let's see, let's see what happens next. But, um, but yeah, that brings us to our topic for the night and that is royalties. So Dave or Jerusha, do you want to just give us like a quick brief of what, what a royalty even is when it comes to an NFT and how that relates to wine? Yeah. Do you want me to jump in, David? It's up to I you. I could, either way. No, you, you, you probably it's know more easy, than me. It's an easy one to answer. So it, it's essentially like what a royalty has always been in the music and um, uh, me, traditional media industry. It's like whatever content that you produce, uh, 
if it is distributed or someone purchases it in the future, you get a percentage of it as the as the creator or owner of that content. So um, wineries will in the future receive proceeds from every resale of a bottle that they release uh, that is attached to an NFT. Right. And how do you think that's going to affect winemakers? I mean, if they earn like 10% from each aftermarket trade, and let's say an average investment grade wine trades three times in the aftermarket, that's going to like significantly, they're going to earn significantly more over time, right? I have lots of thoughts, but David, you're the winemaker, so you should take it first. <laughs> well, I think the, the whole for investment grade wine, if you talk to those producers, there's a love-hate relationship with the secondary market. They like having a secondary market that pushes, you know, if you talk to really smart ones like Sinequinon or somebody, they say, yeah, we try and keep our secondary market price at about 30, 40% above uh, uh, the, what they release it for. Um, and, uh, but there's a hate for it because they don't want to lose that share. So everybody always pushes up their retail to try and meet within some range, whether it's 30, 40, 80% of the secondary market. Now, if a winemaker could say, oh, I don't actually, I'll get a little piece of that secondary market. That's a game changer. It could, at least for investment grade wine, they, they will, their, the hate part of the love hate relationship with secondary market will go away. Mm -hmm. right. Do you, do you think, because this is something that I think is, you know, part of the, the resale value of the wine on the secondary market is it's related to the fact that you purchased it, you stored it, like you took care of this wine as a collector, you were able to access it. And if, the producer, if the person who is selling the wine from day one is able to continually participate in the proceeds of every resale, does that impact the price of the wine on day one? Like if, if like you're selling it today at a hundred dollars, do you need to sell it at 90 because you have expected earnings in the future that you're going to reap? I think at least the smart producers would think about their future revenue and maybe consider dropping the price. But at investment grade wine, how often do you have you ever seen a vintage price reduction? Never. So I think it I think they're just going to be happy that they can make even more money. Now you could also say uh, instead of decreasing the price, you could say let's not increase it as much next year, but they're gonna go with the flow of everybody else in their region uh, and push as hard as they can. And the willingness to pay of the consumer, you think, will stay the same. Yeah, because I, oof, it's a good question about whether the, the knowledge that they'll lose a little piece of their resale uh, earnings to the, to the uh, winery owner. Yeah, but depending on what that percentage is, I don't know whether that'll affect the consumer. Listen, let's, there are some people that invest in wine as an actual investment, but most people that buy wine thinking, oh, good, I got this and I can resell it. Yeah. How many of them actually resell it? How many have it just drink it or keep it in their cellar as, as still an unopened trophy? So the financial smarts of those people that might be, in, there's not, I don't think there's going to be that much impact of losing a small portion of their resale back in royalties. I, I don't think. I guess we'll have to see though. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's also important to know that not every NFT, so as we said before, an NFT is a smart contract, lives on the blockchain. So not every NFT will have a royalty written into its contract. It doesn't have to, right? So um, it is going to be the choice of the winemaker in the end. Um, but what do you what do you guys think about, about do, do winemakers deserve a royalty? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Yeah. Do you think the consumer would think so? I think the consumer cares more about the winemaker than they care about anybody in the distribution yeah. chain. So they would like to Agreed. support their, yeah. But I think there's an interesting corollary to, should they get a royalty? Should the producer pay if the price goes down? Mm. Interesting. Now it's not that often that investment grade right. wine goes down, but occasionally it does. Should That's there be an onus? 
No, of course, it's up to how the NFT, NFT smart contract is written, that it's only a, a royalty paid on ups and not a reverse royalty paid on downs, but, yeah. you know. That's a really interesting, I mean, not just for wine, but I think just, you know, NFTs in general or any asset that's recorded on, on the blockchain, like, is there, could there be in the future, like, you know, shared, if, if there's shared upside, is there shared downside? Yeah. Yeah. And so what do you think some of the interesting things that winemakers, what do you think are some of the interesting things winemakers can do with the royalties? So like charity or funding future, future projects. What do you think? Do you think that'll be a thing? You know, I'm, I'm always surprised by the charity part of the, the um, wine business. I remember being at Maria Sinsky's house. We were training for MW exam. She was in the program and and, you know, Sinsky Vineyards in Napa, big winery. And a, another person in the group was up from L.A. and said, oh, hey, I got my kid's school thing. Can I get a couple of bottles for charity? Absolutely. I'll ship a couple of magnums down to you if they're top wine. The number of times wineries get hit up for charity and yeah. how willing wineries are to give to charity always astounds me. Um, and uh, so, I, I, you know, even if I have examples of, uh, you know, a dollar for each bottle goes to breast cancer research or whatever it is, that was a Jeff Pizzoni project for his rosé. Uh, there's, it never fails to surprise me. So I wouldn't be surprised if some wineries just go, no, I'm not going to deal with the accounting of that. That's going straight to charity. I could yeah. see that. That is so true. I mean, this has nothing to do with NFTs, but it's so funny that how many people think wines exist as a charity to like donate to their event right. that they're hosting. Right. Well, listen, Jerusha, you worked in restaurants for, for ages. Restaurants yeah. are the worst margin places ever. And everybody's yeah. hitting up a chef or GM for, hey, can you donate a table for four yeah. to my kids' school? Jesus, people, these are yeah. hard businesses to run, not a charity. It's, um, I related to that too. I can't tell you how many times like, I was asked, you know, as the wine director to find free champagne for, <laughs> for oh. New Year's Eve. And I'm like, you know, you can only ask so many favors of people right. and, and you need right. to, there, there needs to be like a real return that you're giving them yeah. for them to want to support that. Absolutely. But, yeah. But I, but, I, but I think Jenna, at least at the beginning of this whole royalties, just to get back to your question a, a second, another thought I had was, this is all new to everybody. And so you have a known revenue stream with the winery. You're selling it to your exporter, direct to consumer, whatever it is. Boom, that's part of your operating budget. And now you're going to have this influx of new money coming in. And it's going to take a little while to get that into the forecasts and the budgets and all that. So how much is that going to go? So they might consider it just as like extra money for the first little while. And so maybe charity is that, or maybe it's just extra projects. Yeah, really. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about, so we've talked a little bit about the consumers and the winemakers. What about for wine investors? How do you think this is going to infect, affect investors uh, or even wine investment funds? That's on you, Jerusha. Yeah. 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 So charges a 10% royalty that's going to eat into their returns. Yeah, I think that's sort of what I was talking about before is like, does it impact what they're willing to pay today? Yeah, like right. upon release, if they're, and, but then it calls into question, like the motivation of the, the person who's purchasing the wine, right? Like, and the, the winery, are they producing wine that they want to be collected and traded? Or are they producing wine that they want to be consumed? Some winemakers produce wine that they want to be consumed, but they also need to release it and get cash flow to fund operations, but they don't necessarily want that wine to be consumed upon release. And they may appreciate the fact that a collector will hold on to that wine and seller it for a decade and, you know, cover the cost of air conditioning the room and keeping the wine at perfect temperature and like really protecting it. Um, I don't know, there's, there are those costs, like the cost of storing wine over its lifetime that someone has to pay for. And if everyone is participating in the future value of the wine, then you know what are the costs that get that wine to 10 years from now? And are they, is everyone sharing in the cost of that? Yeah. I don't know. 
so I, 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 I think, I think collectors in general collect like, because they love wine. And if you're collecting wine just simply as a financial asset, then it's like a little less interesting. I think that people who truly collect wine collect it and are part of the wine community because they love the relationships that they have. They love the community that they get to be a part of by, by sharing in it and buying into it. Um, so, and I, I think that's really truly why, you know, 90% of people buy and collect wine. And then there are some who are simply buying it as a, you know, an investment. Yeah. But then in terms of auction houses, for example, right, they usually take a big percentage of the sale. So if a royalty is added on top of that, do you think that's going to turn off buyers or is that still, no, we're mega fans. We're happy to pay the royalty on top of I the... I, if anybody's ever bought anything at auction, you get so excited by seeing a price you won at the hammer and then you go, oh, yeah, damn, how much more do I have to? And so yeah. I think if maybe even just twisting the question around, are you going to see consumers stopping from buying auction? I think you're going to see auction houses pushing back a little bit and saying, how do we not add this extra cost into the, the, the price, the final yeah. price? That's going to be tough because it's sometimes what Jerusha, what is it? Another 35% or something you see on top if you include sales tax and stuff? If you include, yeah, it's it's usually a 22% buyer's premium and then whatever the tax might be. But 22% on top of it. Um it's real, it's a very interesting question for me because I there has to be a marketplace where you can buy and sell and trade these NFTs. And it has to be sort of an independent third party it has to be a third party who builds the infrastructure for all nft projects so divin won't be the only why like we will be the best but you know <laughs> will we be the only organization that has wine offerings that are direct from the producer with an nft attached to it likely no and so there has to be a platform that supports all of these NFT projects and allows buyers and sellers of wine to sell whatever NFT they have. It seems to me that the established auction houses are the ones to build it and that they have more credibility than someone who's just going to be an upstart today, who has no history, no relationship with the wineries, no relationship with the collectors. Um, it's it'll cost an enormous amount, I think, to build the infrastructure. And so there has to be some incentive for them to do that. But I just can't saying, imagine. Jerusha, are you saying that you're, that you think the auction houses will make the clearing houses for these? For these? I, I, in some way, I feel like they need to be connected. I just yeah. don't know who would take their place. I, I, I don't, you know, I, there may, maybe there will be someone who comes along and start something from scratch but I think there's so much credibility and if you think of where most of the current investment grade wine sits it's in sellers of people who are comfortable with these auction houses granted they don't have nfts attached to them so maybe this is irrelevant um but it you know just where where are people comfortable selling and buying these right. types of wines and um, I just don't, I'm not entirely certain yet that somebody new is going to come along. And I, I think it'd be, I, I think it would be, if they're not already doing it, it'd be one of the most important things for these auction houses to be investing in right now. I, I agree with you. There's, there's I think, a, a future of one sort of centralized place to do it. I agree with you. The auction houses are the ones that can do it. Be I worry though that if you go to Christie's or Sotheby's, those people are like old school, like have a wooden hammer thing that hits a table. It's, you know, yeah. that's, it, they just don't have the idea of where the technology is going. But the challenge with wine is there are so many SKUs and so many items that are available to that, that are investment grade because you have one wine and you could have 30 vintages of it. You have to be an expert. And those, those auction houses, those people are experts. They know every single wine and how it's traded and how it's moved. So it's about joining the, the, digi the knowledge and the digital. And, yeah. 
I, yeah. I agree with you, but I also say good luck to Christie's and Sotheby's to make it happen. <laughs> They're not going to make that happen. We actually we did an event um, at Sotheby's in London two weeks ago. Um, David Garrett, one of our co-founders, and I were there. It was a really interesting panel about art, wine, and NFTs specifically. Um, and it was really interesting to see kind of the feedback in the room because I think this is something, I mean, Sotheby's is, is working with NFTs, right? So, of course. Um, and I think that that, you know, merging into the world of wine is is definitely going to happen. So whether or not it's okay, is Sotheby's then, or or is there a third party that comes in and, and verifies the authenticity of wines coming from people's personal sellers, from these collectors that have these incredible sellers, um, you know, because we're not just talking about wines that are to be collected that are, you know, new current vintage coming from the, from the estate. Uh, so it's interesting to kind of also think about it. Like what about all the wines that are already being stored how do you get the digital cork attached how do you get the nft attached yeah who verifies it yeah. well and i think the auction houses know this this model of they don't actually have the art in the auction house and art most investment grade high-end art is sitting in vaults in switzerland it's not in people's homes hanging on sh on shelves in the same way wine is a remote thing if you could avoid shipping the wine to sotheby's and christie's for evaluation and have, yeah, they have that experience at least too, that it's all kind of remote. Now it's just a matter of putting the technology together with it. Yeah. I, I think going back to what you, you said, Jana, I think that an auction house could be the one who could verify these older bottles of wine and retroactively, maybe with the permission of the winemaker and the, the house, you know, the, the producer attach tasting tokens attach digital corks i think i think that the tasting tokens like we're i know we're talking about royalties but i think tasting tokens are the most val it's the most valuable thing about this whole nft project um and great that instagram is going to start supporting it right i know right it's it is it's very exciting um i talked a little bit about tasting tokens and i didn't want to like go down a rabbit hole but jerusha i'd love to hear what you think is so valuable about the tasting tokens, just in, in a nutshell. We love to share our experiences. We love to memorialize our experiences um, in general and specifically with wine. We like to remember we had these wines. We like to remember who we had them with. You know, so much of sharing wine, regardless of price point, is like who brought it, who like, who, sh who discovered this winemaker, who shared it with the group and, being able to kind of record that and see that. And like, I, I think it's interesting for people who like to think that they're taste makers. Like it can become proof that you truly are a taste maker amongst your community. Um, mm -hmm. And plus you can, you can show what you've actually experienced and that your opinion has valid validity behind it. Like you have, you have a platform on which to stand given everything that you've tasted. Um, and that that's one thing. There's so many, so many things like just, you know, showing that you had access to certain things, whether it's fine, fine and rare, or just fun to drink. And then also like what circles you're in, if that's somewhat yeah. part of the wine community for better or worse. Yeah, no, yeah, it's that, it's, it's that idea of sharing too, that you've shared it. Yeah. And because you always remember who you were with when you drank that bottle of wine. Yeah. You know, or who opened it for you? You know, when you had a chance to taste that wine, who opened it? You remember that. Yeah. As absolutely. part of wine. Yeah. Uh, I think Dan Petrosky said it the other day. Dan Petrosky is a, a winemaker in California. For those of you who don't know, uh, he's also a founding member. Um, and he put it best the other day. He said he's never opened a bottle of wine in his life without sharing it. He would never open a bottle of wine and just sit down and drink it alone. Like this is, a, this is something to be shared. Um, and that is the beauty of wine, the community and the sharing and, and yeah. So I think the tasting tokens are also really, really cool for that. Um, all right. So let's take it back to royalties for one second. Um, do you guys think that there's going to be a with royalty and with, without royalty pricing scheme then in the market? Like AB testing? <laughs> Maybe I'm sure. I'm sure there will be someone, someone will. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think, and it's, it's also it depends where you are. Like for us starting our first vintage release, we're not going to put a royalty on it because we want to see where it goes. But then in five years, when we are, you know, massively successful, then we'll throw some royalties on it for sure. 
Right. Yeah. And it's, but it's a question of how much we're going to put, you know, how much should a producer put on? 2%, 3%, 5%, 10%. Yeah, there's actually a question here in the chat from JD. What percentage needs to go to winemakers to take the hate out of the love and hate? Mm. It, it depends on what you're you're reselling it for. At Domaine de la Romane Conti, you could put 2% on it and you'd still make a lot of money going back. But then at the same time, you think, why should a secondary market reseller make 2000 a bottle off of it? Maybe they should take 90% of that to try and stop that. And if you talk to Aubert de Valaine, he doesn't like anybody reselling it. He only wants people drinking it anyway. Um, yeah, I think it depends on the price point, how much you think that gap between primary and secondary market is. And it's, it's about learning what that impact is on your resaleability. If you make it too high, it won't resell. And then you're squishing that distance between first and second price. It's a t it's, I think that's the market's going to have to decide that. And people are going to have to experiment a little bit. What do you think, yeah. Jerusha? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that... Um... I, I don't know how to price it yet. I don't have an answer. I haven't like really thought about, about pricing it. Um, but I do, I almost wonder if like anything under, like say anything that's a single digit feels like almost like a pass off. So maybe it's like 7.5 or 8%, like somehow 10% feels significant, but you know, anything that's a single digit somehow is, it feels right. more comfortable, even if, it if you have, let's say it's Domaine de la Roman, uh, no, sorry, let's say it's uh, Sinequinon that releases a wine at, uh, I think, at 200, 200 US dollars, and it, and it gets some big points, and it goes for 400. So you're talking a gap of between primary and secondary of 200. 10% is only 20 bucks. Yeah. But I guess that's not all investment grade is going to jump that much. But, you know, as we see, it's... It's surprising how much they can jump. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. if you look at something like like Ganavat, is going to have an increase, but it's only going to be forty dollars or forty euros per bottle for some of their top wines. Um, yeah, it's I don't know. It's a yeah. tough question. I will say though, like with if we think about what's happening just in general in in the creator economy, and not that wineries are necessarily obviously part of that, but you know, Patreon is such a thing, Substack, like there, I think that as that culturally we are becoming more comfortable and wanting to support people who are creators and, and to give them some sort of percentage and to support them. And so that there's maybe just some, a, a cultural acceptance with, with this idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Supporting I think, and I think we, we, we need to educate consumers a little bit about what, uh, you know, what winemakers are actually making on a bottle of wine compared to the, yeah. all the different people in the distribution chain. And yeah. uh, there was a tweet yesterday from somebody who said that a server in the UK can make more money on the tip on a bottle of wine than the producer makes in profit on the bottle of wine. Yeah. And, you know, there's, it's a, it's a, the wine business is a tough business because nobody makes any money in it. But at the same time, why shouldn't they be making some money? And certainly the lowest rung really often is the producer. Yeah. Maybe not an investment grade level, but um, it's, yeah. There, it's I, I, for myself, what I, what I say is that there's no wealth creation in the wine industry, but many, many people live a good life. So there's real no wealth accumulation, but there are many people along the supply chain who are able to live a really comfortable, nice life. They're able to you know, eat and drink well, provide good education for their kids, travel and have like a fulfilling life. But if wealth creation is your goal, it's not the right industry to be in. No. Right. No. All right, we've got another interesting question here in the chat from Gregory. If a winemaker begins to get royalties, will winemakers have a new sense of responsibility to add some extra utility to the NFT, maybe in real life events or perks or mm. not at all? I think when you, you know, one of the things about winemakers in the traditional model of export manager, importer, distributor, retail on-premise sales, 
is you lose sense of that connection with your final customer, but you also don't have any responsibility to the final customer, or at least most of them don't feel like they have any responsibility. The best ones will still try and deliver some content and some connection. But if you are getting back from your customer, I think there is an obligation to give some value back to that customer. Now, it, it could be on-premise events. It could be a, you know, a direct contact with that person, becoming a membership part of the website where you get special videos, whatever it is. Uh, I think there is an obligation from the winemaker to, to, to give value. Right. Anything from you, Jerusha? I think that was pretty, pretty well, well yeah. answered. Cool. Yeah. All right. We've got a question from Chris. Do wines with NFTs attached need to be purchased with crypto or can they be bought with fiat? Do we, do we know this yet? I mean. Um, no, I don't know that there's a set answer, but I think if an auction house is building the platform, they're going to accept crypto and fiat. Right. Yeah. I almost think that we'll soon be seeing a transparent currency. You buy it with this or buy it with that. It's going to end up there or here. The transfers will be made. It'll yeah. be whatever that person wants. You know what I mean? Whatever you want to pay in. Digital USD. I like that, David. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this must have gone back to the question we had before. We've got uh, a comment from Oana. Amen to that. As a small wine producer, I struggle a lot and feel like giving up almost daily. Oh man, hang in there. You Oana. mean about the money? About the money, I guess that's the financial part. Yeah. It, listen, if I, if I have to tell you that yet again, I'm going back to the bank for yet another line of credit and some other loan for some <laughs> other cash flow issue we have. Uh, you're you're not alone, so hang in there. Yeah, the banks are your friends. I tell I know that may not seem like they're your friend, but they're like they'll as long as you're selling your wine and you're not overextending yourself, they're happy to give you the money you need to keep going. They're like yeah. they're, they're your partner. Like they they succeed if you succeed. Uh, just for those of for those of you on the on the watching that don't really understand how crushingly cash flow this business is, I bought my vineyard uh, four years ago, just over four years ago. We had our first vintage, two thousand eighteen. We paid a purchase price. We paid uh, and all the taxes and transfer fees. We paid for vineyard workers for the last four years. We paid for four harvests. We paid for four winemakings. We paid for dry goods, bottles, corks, capsules, everything. We paid for storage. We paid for transportation. We paid for everything. And we made our first sale three, four weeks ago. The it, first cash flow in four it, and a half years. That's, it must have been a good feeling. It was good, but I need more of it. So. <laughs> I, I've done it, so many cash flow models on vineyards, whether pre planted or post planting or grafting or, you know, ripping up and replanting. And I'm happy when they break even. Yeah. It's a crushingly cash flow business, but everybody along the chain is cash flow as well. You just look at a restaurant where your world, it's, uh, you know, you've, you've paid for the wine and it's sitting in a cellar or a closet or whatever it is in your restaurant. And you need to move that product to get that cash flow to pay for the next del delivery. It's tough, tough business. Yeah. You need to buy your fruit. If you're, if you're per in California and you're purchasing fruit, you need to pay for that fruit and you may not have released your next vintage yet. So you don't have the cash to pay for the fruit that you have to buy because you have to make wine to sell next year or two years from now. Totally. All right, we've got another comment. This is from actually about 20 minutes ago. So we're going back uh, from Chris. Willingness of consumer to purchase certain collectible should increase with an NFT attached if wine is stored by third party. Assign the royalties to others for cash to fund other projects. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think I think that storage in other places, especially in the UK, here in Europe, people store their wine in bond it's in a warehouse in London. And you that could change hands four times. And I would pay more for that wine than some wine that's gone to somebody's cellar and then got on a truck and gone to somebody else's and then went to the auction house. Oh, no, that, that's the joy of that traceability within NFTs is the provenance. Yeah. Agreed. All right, so I think we'll we'll wrap it up. If there's no other um, 
no other major comments or questions, then uh, I think this has been really fascinating. Uh, I hope everybody who's watching has enjoyed. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to check out the Club Divin website. We've got all kinds of information on there about the three NFTs that we are working with uh, and also about the club membership. So yeah, we are coming up to our public launch. We're still in our friends and family onboarding right now. Um, so if you're interested, send us a message. Um, and, and yeah, there'll be a lot more of these webinars coming up. So keep an eye on our events page uh, on the website. And thank you so much, David and Jerusha, for your time. This has been really eye-opening.